Hello and welcome to Our Time. I'm Janice and this is Malcolm. Hello, Malcolm. I'm looking into your eyes. Oh, do. Why? What's wrong? What's well, wrong? because today we're going to find out a bit more about eyes and how they age and we're also talking about smoking and what smoking can do to you and how to stop. Yes. So let's start off by introducing Professor Anthony Phillips. Welcome, welcome. to the program. Thank you. Now, I know you prefer to be called Anthony, oh, Tony, Tony, I mean Anthony, so let's call you Tony. <laughs> the reason that we ask you on the show is because you've looked after my eyes for quite some time. So it seemed like a good opportunity to talk about eye care because uh, I've noticed, I don't know how you're doing, mm -hmm. but I've noticed as I'm getting older, my eyes are deteriorating and I need to change glasses regularly. I think too, at our age, for the viewers, um, just... 23. What... <laughs> what questions we should be asking um, as to what to do for the, um, to take care of our eyes. What we, sh we should be asking you. Uh, I think the important thing is that as we do age, you do need a fairly regular eye examination, typically every two years. So it's not a, a great onus. Um, you should certainly go along with any symptoms that you've got, and the optometrist should start asking you a lot of questions. You know, what's your problem? When does it occur? How long has it uh, happened uh, that you've had symptoms? Mm -hmm. He'll want to know about your general health, the medication that you're on. Many people that we see just have no idea what medication they're even on. You know, just take white tablets. Oh. Yeah, it's um, amazing, isn't it? Yes. And and uh, they'll want to know about your family history. Uh, many eye conditions are inherited. You're more likely to get glaucoma if one of your parents or grandparents did. Same with macular degeneration. So it's important to know what the family history is. So that's really useful information to take along with you. Well, actually, that's really informa uh, useful information to start with when you make the appointment um, to actually perhaps prepare a list of the questions that you need to answer like that. Absolutely. So um, I've never been asked that, oh, I've been asked that in a consultation, but I've never been asked that when making an appointment. So that's probably something we should keep in our mind uh, when we make an appointment to ask the question, what questions might you be asking me? That's So that great. I can check those things out. Mm. Yes. But um, in reality, eye care has become, has gone such a long way in the last couple of hundred years, hasn't it? Absolutely. Uh, mainly because if you go back a hundred years, the average lifespan was so short, people didn't get much beyond their 40s and 50s. Now people are living to 80, 90, 100. Uh, unfortunately, the incidence of all these eye diseases does increase, so yeah. it's important to look after your eyes. And your eyes don't really, do they wear out or is it eye diseases that really... Uh, to degenerate our sight. Um, I was looking for that there word. Is, there is a certain amount of uh, uh, ageing uh, deterioration, the same as with the rest of your body. Uh, but it's amazing. We had a, a corneal graft at Flinders. A uh, lady had the same corneal graft for 50 years, and the donor came from an 80-year-old. So the actual corneal yeah, graft wow. was 130 years old. Wow. So we're quite capable of going longer. But again, we need to look after the health of your eyes and your general health. Your general health has a very profound effect on your eyes. And I guess, too, it is the individual as you said you know what sort of um, health you have at the time and how what sort of tablets you are taking how it can affect your vision that's right some and medication what, uh, does affect eyes oh. and fortunately most of it doesn't and I guess what you inherit yes. obviously yeah uh, so Tony you're a professor at Flinders here in South Australia but mm. you're also in private practice yes so it means that you're in a way got the best of both worlds Yes, I'll have to keep my feet on the ground. Yeah, well, <laughs> it's true though, learning more, teaching more and seeing more. Yes. Um, so, so I've turned up for an eye check and I, and I, I sort of got a dry eye. I've got a, oh, I've got a few problems. What does a normal eye actually look like? In terms of uh, what we see at the back of the eye, do you mean? Mm. Mm. Yes, OK. Yeah. You know, when, when you go for an eye, examination we've got and some, you look We've got some photographs here yeah. so we can actually show you what they look like. Um, so let's start off with a normal eye. Fine. Well, if we look at this on the left-hand side, the whitish area is where the optic nerve comes into the eye and that carries the signals from the retina back to the brain. And what's uh, that little dark spot? That's the macula. Right. And that's slightly more pigmented. Um, and again, that's where all the, the cones are packed very tightly, which is our detailed area of the retina. Right. So some of the diseases that can occur to the eye, we'll show you some more uh, pictures. This is a testing time for you to see if you <laughs> yes. know what they are. Green is pretty. <laughs> right. 
this is a diabetic and the little white areas are little leakages of fluid into the retina and below that you can see little uh, hemorrhages. Uh, now that person... Is the little dark spots? Little dark spots, mm -hmm. yes. A little leakage from the very fine capillaries. And that person would probably have no symptoms at all. They would not be aware of what's happening. And that's why diabetes is the number one cause of blindness in this country. So anybody that does have diabetes is really do have to have their eyes checked regularly? Absolutely, yes. Uh, type 1 diabetics should be seen annually. Type 2 diabetics either one to two years, depending on how severe it is. Oh, okay, let's okay. have a look at some more, because I find these most interesting. Now, this sunset is... over the Nullarbor. <laughs> <laughs> this is macular degeneration. And if you look at that central area, instead of that nice pigmented spot, you can see the whole area is just degenerating. Yes. And that person would lose all their central vision, which is very, very sad. Right. And moving on? That's a little tiny leakage of one blood vessel. Almost in the centre. Yes, it yep. may be from high blood pressure, it may be from arteriosclerosis, and again, it could even be diabetes. And but how again, would you know, sorry to interrupt you, but how would you know if you have that? Again, you would have no awareness no. whatsoever. Uh -huh. okay. The front of the eye is very, very sensitive to pain, but the retina has no pain sensation at all. Mm. Okay. okay. And next we have... Again, another little lesion there, that could be an infection, it could be a, a burn, it could be all sorts of different things. But again, right out of the periphery, the person would have no awareness of it. Mm -hmm. So what you're saying, in most cases, until you're really looking into the eyeball properly at a proper examination, um, it's not just about getting glasses, it's really about looking at the condition of the eye. Yes, um, the optometrist we train at Flinders University, there's a huge emphasis on disease detection. Right. Sometimes general health conditions will show up in the eye, more commonly it's diseases of the eye. Um, if you look, for example, at glaucoma, it's the third cause of blindness in this country. It's totally preventable. No one should go blind from glaucoma. Oh, really? It's just a case of being checked. And being so, aware of what's in, yeah, yeah. happening. Um, but what about cataracts too? Because that's another thing. I've always thought a cataract is something that uh, grows across your eye. It's like a cloudy... It's, am I describing this right? It's like a cloudy <laughs> spot that comes across your eye. Yes, it's a very common uh, misunderstanding that uh, cataract is a, like a skin that grows over oh. the eye. It's not that at all. The lens inside our eye is largely made up of proteins. And if you think of cooking an egg, as you cook the egg, the, the, the egg loses transparency. And that's what happens to the lens in our eye. As we go through life, the effect of um, ultraviolet, infrared, uh, oxidants in our food, or uh, this sort of thing, it just causes the lens to coagulate. So the effect is, as you describe, it's a slow, increasing sort of haze in your vision. So is that something that needs to be treated quickly or um, how fast does that actually affect the eye? Okay, how long's a piece of string? Okay. Um, <laughs> I, I saw someone recently who within six months went from almost no sign of cataract to needing surgery. In other people it can be 20 years. So each person has to decide themselves, at what point is it affecting my lifestyle? Yeah. You know, is it a nuisance? Can I live with it? Um, the example I give people, it's very much like your car windscreen. We can all put up with a little bit of haze in the car windscreen, but at a certain point we say, no, we've got to wash this car. Mm. And it's the same with cataract. It's when it affects your enjoyment of life. Yeah. But it used to be a big operation. Yes. Uh, when my grandmother had a cataract operation when I was a teenager, uh, it was two weeks in hospital, uh, head sandbag, blindfold, and you had to be virtually blind before they'd do it. The cataract was, uh, had to be ripe, as they used to call it, which meant it was totally opaque. Nowadays, it's a 20-minute procedure, there's no stitches anymore, and recovery is pretty well 24 hours. Wow. Amazing, isn't it? Yeah. Ah. And, and I suppose that's the most important message to get across to everybody, is that with the new technology that we have, you can look inside of an eye, you can slice the eye up to see yes. exactly what's right or wrong. Mm. Yes. Um, you can then diagnose what's required for that. You can obviously go to the right people, specialists, whatever needs to be yes. done. Yes. And the simplest thing for most eye conditions is glasses. Um, that's probably the most common thing we see. A lot of people have problems, not so much because they have a visual problem, but the two eyes don't work together very well. So if they've got what we call a binocular vision problem, they will still get symptoms. Right. So the important thing is, do the eyes work together as a pair properly? Is the focus of the eyes correct? And are the eyes healthy? Well, I wear, I currently have three different sets of glasses <laughs> for three of them. Yes. I've got glasses all over the place. So I have some for reading, which are quite well magnified. I have some for working computer, and I have some for distance, watching TV, movies and driving. Um, I find that 
because I don't want to wear glasses all the time, I'm happy to carry three sets of glasses around <laughs> with me. But of course, with the new technology and the way lenses can be formulated, you can obviously have one lens for everything. Um, yes and no. I mean, I have a single pair of spectacles, so I've got my distance at the top, then it grades into reading at the bottom. And for most people, that's all they need. Uh, but many people have a specific need. If you're working on a computer, for example, uh, the actual computer area of my lens is fairly small. Yep. If I was working on a computer for several hours a day, I would want a completely different design of lens, which is obviously your case. Yes, it is. Mm. And I'm comfortable doing that, but um, sometimes you just get frustrated with it all. What about... Um, the lenses that change into uh, like sunglasses when you go out in the in the sun are those things advisable? Um, all modern spectacles will absorb a fair amount of UV, uh, so even my clear ones will absorb something like sixty percent of the ultraviolet, which is pretty good. Oh, okay. Um, photochromics absorb a hundred percent, so if you are concerned about ultraviolet damage, you're working a lot outdoors, then you can either have a separate tinted prescription, which is a hundred percent UV absorbing. But the advantage of a photochromic lens it means that you don't have to keep swapping spectacles. Okay. So in our next segment with Ken, we're talking about smoking and mm -hmm. how smoking can affect the body. What about the eyes? It's very sad. I mean, I think one in three smokers probably dies of smoking, which is very, very sad. Uh, two in three. Two actually, in three, sorry, yes, okay. Um, but you stand four to five times the chance of developing macular degeneration if you're a smoker than a non-smoker. So if you're one of the lucky survivors of smoking, the sad thing is you stand a high chance of losing your sight. Oh, and your teeth and many other things. Other things as well. Yeah. Tony, thank you so much. That's really great information. We hope that's helped you to understand a little bit more about your eyesight and how important it is to go and have them seen to... Regularly. Regularly by somebody who really knows what they're doing. And we'll be back shortly with Ken talking with a friend of ours about smoking. Welcome back to our time. Wouldn't it be nice to save some money and continue or even regain some good health? My next guest is going to tell us how, maybe even save our lives. Alana Sparrow, the General Manager of the Cancer Council of South Australia joins us. Welcome. Thanks for having me. We're going to talk about smoking or, or not smoking, aren't we? Giving up smoking, Alana. Absolutely. When I started smoking, Many, many years ago, we really didn't know or weren't aware or it wasn't publicised how bad smoking was. But we're being bombarded all the time with anti-smoking messages. I find it hard to believe that anybody would be stupid enough to still smoke. Absolutely. Or take it up anyway. Absolutely. But, but what we still know is that the majority of smokers take up the habit when they're young, so before they're 18 years old. Yeah. And so the, the evidence is really clear on the disconnect between advertising messages and knowing their advertising messages and sort of discerning that and then the habits that you take up. And of course, once they take up smoking, they're addicted for life. It, it, it's surprising, isn't it, just how addictive, uh, well, the chemicals, I guess we're talking nicotine, really is. Absolutely, and our quitline counsellors tell us every day just some of the stories of people who have tried so many times to quit, and it really is a difficult journey. Yeah, I know, I, I tried and tried, I tried everything, but I, I, I guess I just made my mind up and I didn't like something controlling my life. It's a horrible feeling yeah. and it does, it takes over your life. Yeah, and what works for one person won't work for another. So Correct. our message to people is always just to keep on trying to quit. Yeah. So if you fail, try again um, and eventually you find the thing that works for you, be it nicotine replacement or going cold turkey or talking with a quitline counsellor. So you've just got to find the thing that's right for you and keep on trying to quit. I, I know what worked for me. I thought, if I don't give up soon, they're going to be $2 a packet. <laughs> Somebody was saying about $20. About 25. Oh no! Well, how do these people afford it? Yeah, look, absolutely. About 60% of the cost of a packet of cigarettes is, is in taxes, and we see those going up every year. Um, that's intentional to try and get people to quit because the evidence shows that it's a really effective way of driving down the smoking rate. But we've got some evidence that also shows that when cigarettes get more and more expensive, there are people, particularly in low socioeconomic groups, who have to make a choice, who give up things like paying the rent or buying food in order to keep smoking. Oh. That's how addictive it is. Oh, dear. So 
Is there somebody or some organisation they can turn to for help? Absolutely. So the quit line, 13 78 48, um, you're twice as likely to succeed with the help of the quit line as you are if, if you don't use some kind of assistance. So um, wonderful group of people on there. We have de dedicated Aboriginal counsellors who can help our Aboriginal clients and then uh, the rest of the team there. Wonderful people who can help you find what's right for you in your quitting journey. How many alternatives do they have? Well, there's any number. So they work on a sort of motivational interviewing um, kind of way of working. So it's about whether you need somebody talking to you all the time to get you through those hard times, whether you need nicotine replacement, which comes in a variety of forms sure. now, pharmaceuticals like Champix. So many options out there for people. Um, so if one didn't work, keep trying and, and move on to the next. I know my wife and I, we gave up 30 odd years ago at the same time. Well, she had great difficulty. I used to sniff and sneak around and catch her. Uh, but I think it was that uh, product you mentioned, Champix, seemed to do the, do the job. But as you say, maybe it won't work for everybody. Yeah, it's about finding the right thing. Yeah. And, and that's where Quitline can help you. Absolutely. Yeah. What, what about going to the doctor? Can they? Absolutely. And we encourage people to talk to their, to their general practitioner. Um, but it's also quite often some people will feel a little embarrassed about going and talking to the person who's responsible for their mainstream health. Um, they might be lying to them or something. <laughs> well, you never know. <laughs> so, you know, picking up the phone, getting that friendly voice on the other end rather than talking to the person who's been looking after your health the whole way along. And quite often GPs have, have brought up smoking with, with their patients and they haven't been able to succeed before. So if they've tried and failed, they're a bit funny about going back. So we absolutely encourage people to talk to their GP, but if they don't feel comfortable, they can just pick up the phone and call the quit line. Mm, we'll give that number out again too because I think it could, uh, well, it's well worthwhile. With people smoking or not smoking, I don't see many older people now smoking. Are they giving it up and the younger people are taking it up or am I wrong there? No, the youth smoking rate um, was quite encouraging, particularly in states like South Australia that we've just seen come out. So we are seeing the youth rate sort of drop finally, um, but it was the hardest group to get the message through to. So. Bulletproof. <laughs> yeah, Probably. absolutely. Yeah. Um, and there's, you know, peer pressure elements to that and then that disconnect in terms of what is advertising and what it really means. So yeah, sure. it's about getting those messages through. I think also when the Surgeon General first came out and talked about the effects that smoking would have on people, it was a huge shock factor and some of that's probably worn off. So we need to keep getting those messages through to all generations of smokers. Are women taking it up or young girls taking it up at the same rate as uh, males or what are the, what's the balance there? What we're starting to see now is that originally it was men who smoked um, cigarettes and so the lung cancer hit them predominantly to begin with. Women then sort of started smoking later so the, the rates of women with the smoking related cancers are increasing at the moment because of that later take up. Um, but as far as taking up smoking now, the rates are, are fairly even. But you mentioned lung cancer when we go on to emphysema, but there are a lot more diseases that are caused Absolutely. directly by smoking. Yeah, so we're talking about things like heart disease, stroke. We know that um, two out of three long-term smokers will die from a smoking-related illness. So there's a huge gamut of things that we're talking about there. It's, it's our largest preventable burden of illness and disease in this country. Yeah. And and also, I, I I wasn't aware, but other cancers, it's just not uh, lung cancer. It can be bladder cancer and uh, other awful things. Absolutely. It's a risk factor for a number of cancers, ovarian cancer, breast cancer, bowel cancer. The list sort of goes on and on. A, a lot of people say, well, why don't you ban it? I mean, they, they ban DDT, which if you look at it, with the mosquitoes may have saved hundreds of thousands or millions of lives. I don't think smoking's ever saved any lives, has it? No, but our position at Cancer Council is not to call for an outright ban on smoking. And the reason for that is that people became addicted to this product when it was a legal product. So to simply make it illegal at the moment would potentially drive it underground and would also create this huge hardship for people who, as you say, are really badly addicted to the product. Mm. So until we're able, we've, we've got evidence on what we have to do to drive that smoking rate down. And until we can do that, we can't look at, at those kind of end game solutions. I, I, I'm glad you've said that because prohibition doesn't work anyway, does it? It drives it underground and people will make more money out of it anyway and probably the same amount of people will continue to smoke. It also means that people won't have the level of supports that they have now. Sure. So things like the quit line and the advertising that we see with those kind of shock tactics trying to convince people to quit smoking just wouldn't be available if it was prohibited. There have been a lot of, I guess you could say, shock 
tactics over the years. Are they successful? Yeah, they are. So the evidence is really clear that you need a mix of tactics when trying to convince people to quit smoking. Mm. So it's about the advertising measures like tax increases, plain packaging, banning smoking in, in different public areas. But as far as that advertising goes, we also need a mix in that as well. So ads that are emotional, informative, and then those really shocking ads that we see from time to time. Mm. If we could... Uh be specific, what uh, over the last 10, 20 years, what has really worked, do you think? I think the advertising has been huge, um, as well as things, measures like plain packaging and those graphic health warnings that are on the packs now. You simply don't want to look at a packet of cigarettes sitting on a table um, because you've got those horrifying pictures of what can happen to you if you're a smoker. Mm. And it's clear as day that smoking kills, smoking causes cancer, harms your baby, those things are printed in big font across the front of the package. So I think measures like that, some of which Australia's led the way on, have been really important in driving down our smoking rates. Do, do you have an aim to, to eventually eradicate it more and more? Or? Oh, look, absolutely. Our aim would be to have a zero smoking rate. Um, at the end of the day, you know, the, the cancer link is huge and uh, we'd love to see the day when nobody picks up a cigarette. Will that ever happen? <laughs> no. I certainly hope so. <laughs> yeah. how, how, what's the progression been like over the years? It's been quite up and down because it depends what happens with those measures. So we've seen as governments have invested less money in mass media campaigns, we've seen the smoking rates rise. Yeah. And then as they've reinvested, we've seen them go down. So it really depends what's happening with those public policy levers that governments are using. Why do people start smoking in the first place? I, I did. I, I'm sure it was to be a bit of a hero. Or it's, it's silliness, isn't it? Yeah, look, it really comes down to... We know that tobacco companies are clever about the way that they market their product and we know that they're marketing, marketing them to under-18s. Um, and it comes down to the fact that those young people are making decisions about the rest of their lives that are not necessarily informed. Been intriguing to talk with you. Thank you. And I certainly hope you're pleased and not falling on deaf ears. And I, I guess they're not... Give us that quit uh, line number again, Alana. 1378 48, and we'd love to hear from any smokers. Fantastic. Well, no excuses to not smoke. Alana Sparrow, the General Manager of the Cancer Council of South Australia. Eyes are very important, Malcolm. Yes, and giving up smoking is as well. Yeah, but I don't think we actually look after our eyes as much as we should. We, we don't really know the importance of seeing um, an eye specialist no, as often as we should. Mine are fine. I can see everything perfectly. No, but I think, you know, I they do... I see two of them. When, but I think as you get older um, and you tend, you just tend to put things off. This is Actually, not happening that's very to me. True. Um, no, yes. I don't need to do that yet. You yes. know, that sort of thing. I understand that. and But there comes a time where you just sort of realise, gosh, I'm not seeing that well. And Never. I'm driving a car no. in traffic and I'm not seeing that well. And that happened to me just recently, so off I went. Mm. But having your eyes tested is so quick and so simple to do. It's not painful. Um, it's but just... the smoking thing is another point. I think that statistic of two in every three people who smoke will end up with an eye problem? Oh, no, no, with... with well, dying. Blind. Dying, well, cancer. Dying and, dying. yeah. But what and, is it, macular that, de degeneration? Well, it that, but, but it happens to your teeth as well. Yeah, and no. a friend of mine's a dentist. We'll have him on the show soon to talk about what smoking can do to your teeth. But, you know, on a happier note... Yes. Mm, <laughs> we'll see you next time. Keep yourself nice till then. See you then.